Glad to see you all back here. Time does move on, and we are now at the beginning of our last panel before a general discussion. The very informative title of our panel is Challenges and Hazards. And uh, we are going to uh, 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 start with uh, uh, Professor Fania Oz Salzberger. Uh, this uh, conference was very innovative in the attitude towards introductions. <laughs> and I will do what we learned that we should do, which is I will try to find a way to live together with different styles and conceptions of the good introduction. So I will uh, uh, give very short introductions, mainly uh, uh, about uh, what connects our speakers to our conference. So the first, as I said, is Professor Fania O. Salzberger, who is an Israeli historian, writer, and public intellectual. She has been professor of history at the University of Haifa since 1993, member of the Faculty of Law and the Center for German and European Studies, and founding director of the Posen Research Forum for Political Thought. Her Oxford University doctoral thesis on the Scottish and German Enlightenments was supervised by John Robertson and mentored by Isaiah Berlin. It was published as a book by Oxford University Press. She published dozens of articles, including a few on basic issues of theory of democracy in general and Israeli democracy in particular. And she recently, uh, not so recently, published a book uh, with her late father, Amos Oz, about Jews and words. And Fania will talk to us about the liberal deficit in Israel's democracy, a brief intellectual history. Fania. Thank you very much, Ruti. I hope you can all hear me well. I have no idea who put in the public intellectual, but I... Uh, uh, distance myself from this misnomer. Uh, it is very difficult to talk about the history of liberal thought in Israel when we have, I think, sitting in the room, Manny Mautner, who has just published, and I congratulate Manny, a new book, I think it's in the shop this, this week, Haliberalism Israel, Toldotav Bayotav Atidotav, the liberalism in Israel, its history, problems, and futures. Uh, so uh, I wish I could have read this book, but it only came out before the current presentation. The brief intellectual history part of my title has to do with the unfortunate fact that an intellectual history of liberalism in Israel would be brief indeed. And most of its chapters would pertain to the pre-state era rather than to the post sovereignty era, and I will be dwelling uh, on that. Uh, we know, many of us know the term democratic deficit. I checked its origins. It appeared for the first time in the 1970s in the context of the European Union, interestingly enough. But I have not found any uh, scholarly uh, coining of the term liberal deficit. And less than that, the element of a liberal deficit accumulating within an existing democracy, which I think would be a very interesting concept to investigate. Either a liberal de deficit in new democracies who have no liberal traditions, or all democracies with liberal traditions that are now gradually petering out. Israel was considered by quite a few think, think tanks in the last decade who posted uh, democratic uh, um, uh, checklists uh, uh, in their uh, websites as a deficient democracy, a democracy, but a deficient one. However, today uh, it would be very hard to find any democracy whatsoever 
including most of the old, well-established Western democracy, that is not spiraling into some kind of a democratic deficit. And thus, I think it is interesting to talk about the liberal deficit within a democracy, and I will be focusing on Israel. Although there is no coined term liberal deficit, many people living in Israel know the kind of Friday evening living room conversation uh, that brings up the notion that Israel has no liberal tradition. This is almost a cliche. Most of the founding fathers and mothers of the state of Israel came from non-liberal countries, grew under non-liberal uh, governments. This was not something that Israel um, could have gleaned from its founders, and it might have gleaned something from the British mandate, but that too is a problem-ridden legacy. And so when I try to carve out an account of Israel's liberal deficit, which would be a historical account, I'm not purporting, of course, to give a full-blown history of this, uh, it would be useful, especially in view of our previous sessions, to clarify what liberalism we are talking about. Uh, one of the surprising things out there when I try to talk about liberalism to more general audiences or on the net, in the social networks, the number of Israelis who confuse between political and economic liberalism is astounding. Most people think that liberalism has to do with economic liberalism, with libertarianism, with the so-called neoliberalism. Very few Israelis have had any chunk of education or reading about the classic lineage of political liberalism, which we have been taking for granted here, and which will also be my own starting point. So I am talking about political liberalism or civil liberalism, along the well-known line of evolution and development from John Locke and the Glorious Revolution into Charles-Louis de Montesquieu and some of the founders of the uh, American independence, especially uh, the Madison um, a part or group, uh, the Federalists. Uh, John Stuart Mill, who in my own reading revolutionized uh, political liberalism, and all the way into the 20th century, um, Isaiah Berlin, I will dwell on him, John Rawls, not so much. Uh, this is the lineage in which Israel today is found lacking in the knowledge, in the history, in the discourse of this classical political liberalism. I will also uh, put forward another basis for my analysis, which has been mentioned in, here before, and I think in the first day yesterday I quoted uh, the recent book of uh, Jean Werner Müller from uh, Princeton. Is there a can there be a modern democracy, a viable modern democracy, a true modern a modern democracy which is not liberal? Some, some people think it is doable, but uh, I um, go with a fairly prevalent assumption that modern democracy, if it is a democracy, is a liberal democracy, and then we can negotiate about the kind of liberalism that underlies modern democracy, whether it is a narrow one, a broad one, thin or thick, this is negotiable. But basically, a modern democracy relies on the cluster of liberal, political liberalism, which is older by, by about two centuries than modern democracy itself. And this cluster incorporates the rule of law, the separation of powers inclusive of a strong independent judiciary, free and open civil discourse, human and civil rights. And once again, the details are very often negotiable within liberal democracies, but without the basis of this a cluster, a modern democracy cannot be a democracy. And so when we try to locate 
to put our finger on the historical timeline of this commonsensical notion that Israel has a liberal deficit, certainly Israel today. The interesting question is when? When are we talking about the beginning or the accumulation of a liberal deficit? And I will begin by saying where it is not to be located. Not in early Zionism. Not in Theodor Herzl, who was a liberal, hyphenated perhaps with some other clusters of a political philosophy. I'm leaving Moses Hess to Shlomo Avineri. It is a, a, a controversial question about Moses Hess's um, belonging to, to a liberal uh, tradition. And nor is it throughout the history of the state and in current Israel located, nor is the deficit located or recognizable in the Israeli uh, judiciary or academia or broad civil society, NGOs, and activism. This is not to say that the Israeli judiciary, academia, civil society, NGOs, activism is made purely of liberals. This is not the case, nor should it be the case. But this is not where a deficit can be located, can be uh, diagnosed. In fact, Israel today, even beyond the branches I have listed, judiciary, academia, uh, NGOs, etc., many Israelis hold on to something not very far from what I might call liberal instincts not perhaps very acquainted with the theory, the legacy, the written history, but liberal uh, instincts that hail not from a powerful liberal base or educational content, but from other roots of Israeli society, including socialism and including the Jewish tradition. Both socialism and the Jewish tradition are able, were able over Israeli history to channel liberal notions or instincts into current discourse. The liberal deficit itself is clearly seen in the absence in the history of the state of Israel or indeed the pre-state Yishuv institution of a ruling party self-defining itself as prominently liberal. We did not have a liberal ruling party. Nor did we have a ruling party that called itself by a different name, but raised the flag of liberalism per se as a recognizable chunk of, it, of its uh, values and beliefs. This is the first field in which a liberal deficit is noticeable. And the second, but perhaps for now more important field, um, Israel has developed precious little liberal theory. There are a few exceptions. But no liberal theorist has managed to capture the mind's imagination of the general public in Israel. No liberal th theorist resident in Israel. Nor has public education in Israel or the knowledge of mainstream high school educated, even university Israel, educated Israelis, ever quite captured the notion of classical liberalism. So the two deficits, so the two deficits, thank you, are very clear and visible. No political body party, institution, clearly associated with liberalism in the playing field of politics. I'm not talking about NGOs. And no educational um, Schwerpunkt in liberalism. Not even in the good old days when civics classes, as Rahut still dared to raise their heads and teach something about Human rights, certainly not now, when they have to put their heads down in many parts of the Israeli school system. So 
looking at the very birth of political Zionism, we could say that the situation boded a different future. Herzl, himself well-read in liberal theorists, both the British and German liberal thought of the 19th century, and his immediate circle, the founders, the launchers of the Zionist Congress, as well as the Zionist Congress itself as an institution, famously allowing, giving women the right of vote in the second meeting, the second year in Basel, performed not just democratically, but also liberally, as did the two main writings of Herzl that pertained either to the utopia or to the program of the future state of the Jews. Both Altneuland and Der Judenstadt are recognizably liberal in the late 19th century, early 20th century contour, but still recognizably so. The crux, the kernel of the future small parties that entered and for a while survived in the Israeli, early Israeli political field, one of which was even called uh, the independent liberals, Zibali Matzmaim, their origin, their kernel, was from the large numbers of delegates in the early Zionist congresses who did not adhere to any of the strong ideologies, either socialist or later on revisionist or otherwise, but called themselves general Zionists, or in Hebrew, Zionim Stam. The term comes from the very early years, just Zionists. And those just Zionists, as the First World War turned and transformed the main playing field of the Zionist movement from Basel, from Central Europe, from Western Europe, from Eastern Europe to the land of Israel, Palestine. Within this transformation, those general Zionists, and there are some interesting studies of that, partially transformed themselves into a middle class of sort, a middle schichte, who voted for the embryos of the future center parties that were always quite small, uh, sometimes interestingly small, uh, the General Zionist Party, later on um, the independent liberals, Lamedain. One more point, important point, about the pre-state embryo of what could have become a future liberal crux or hub is mainly the Yeke German Jewish immigration. Uh, and within the German Jewish uh, immigration, the very few who went into politics and the quite many who went into uh, the professions of the law, from whom the first generation and the second generation of Supreme Court justices, as well as the Minister of Justice, of course, and the Comptroller General and others um, have emerged. I have written elsewhere, together with my colleague uh, Eli Salzberger, and others have written about this German-Jewish element of um, the Israeli judiciary, of the first high echelon generations of the Israeli judiciary, a, a moderating effect, a powerful sense of the independence of the judiciary, and some elements that were clearly liberal, but liberal according to the German legacy, which sat very well with the Zionist reality. The German legal, liberal legacy not only allowed, but in a way dovetailed with a moderate national consciousness. And here I'm using my teacher Isaiah Berlin's distinction, which I still deem very useful, between nationalism as the perted, fervid, extremist nationalism, pre-fascist, post-fascist, today again, and the moderate or benign nationhood, national feeling, national consciousness, all of those Isaiah Berlin's terms, 
And this moderate mode of national consciousness fit very well into the kind of statemently liberalism that the Supreme Court gleaned over the first decades from its uh, Weimarian, in some cases even pre-Weimarian uh, sources. Um, I'm going to fast forward, and I will fast forward to the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence and the first and second decades of the state of Israel, the Declaration of Independence, today not a very popular document in the Israeli public sphere. It would be considered to be, it is considered to be, to, to be today by many right-wingers, not all, a dismally left-wing declaration. It does not contain the word democracy, nor does it contain the word liberalism, but of course liberty, Hofish and Herut. Uh, but it is certainly one of uh, the few clearly liberal uh, constitutional documents that Israel has, uh, although it is difficult in today's climate to fall back upon it in political discourse in Israel. David Ben-Gurion, was a self-taught Democrat. I love those diary entries that we can read in the archive in Sdeboker when he describes how he reads and admires the famous text of Pericles, the funeral oration. Ben-Gurion was a somewhat romantic Democrat, but very much a, self, a fiercely self-defined Democrat. Liberalism was not part of the menu that Ben-Gurion announces, at least in his writings and diary, but a Democrat he was. Uh, and now a great absence, an eminence grise. The eminence grise was a great absent shadow in the history of political liberalism in Israel in its early years and in the late Yishuv years, is called Chaim Weizmann. I would like to suggest that Weizmann's choice, perhaps a personal choice, perhaps under pressures, perhaps for other reasons, not to become an active political leader, party leader, but to be Israel's eternal, or Zionism's eternal foreign minister, successfully, very successfully, and then landing into the seat of the first president of Israel, made us miss out on a potential leader of a big liberal party. But Weizmann was no party maker. He was not perhaps able, nor did he want, arguably, to create a liberal hub around himself and, and, and to form a Zionist liberal entity present in the Knesset. He could have, he might have, he did not. This is an original sin, not of Weizmann himself. I'm not an expert in the life of Weizmann, nor am I here to judge him. But this is the clearest absence in the gamut of early State of Israel political scenery. No center liberal party headed by a figure able to be a pivotal figure, a main figure, and maybe even a theorist of liberalism in Israel itself. This is the story of an absence. And yet, during the 1950s, uh, the kind of liberal thinking that flourished, flourished quietly in the Supreme Court, in the German-born or German-educated, partially, but, but an important part, uh, Supreme Court. And to put it in the words of uh, Professor Pnina Lahav, uh, the Supreme Court in its first decade developed, I'm reading the Hebrew version, Torat Mishpat Shel Sha'atnez, Ben liberalism, le collectivism. This can be translated into some kind of an 
uneasy blend, an uneasy but working blend of liberalism and collectivism, I would replace Pnina's collectivism with national consciousness or national feeling, not nationalism. So the same German tradition served well in, early, in the early independent state of Israel. How am I doing time-wise? Oh, goodness. Okay, I will be even quicker. One thing that the 1950s left us as a, a pretty illiberal legacy, and it is going strong even today, is the uh, tradition of whole blocks of the population voting together for one charismatic leader. Uh, Ben-Gurion enjoyed it electorally no end because so many of the new immigrants in the 1950s would vote for Ben-Gurion for charismatic reasons. Begin inherited these blocks and now we see them again supporting Benjamin Netanyahu in different sociological shades. Uh, this was one of the illiberal legacies of the 1950s. Uh, the deficit of the 1960s, the accumulating deficit by now, um, has to do, of course, with the Six-Day War and the rise of religious messianism, of nationalistic messianism, one of the most illiberal turns in young Israeli history. But I also want to say something about the Jerusalem Academia. There was only a Jerusalem, almost only a Jerusalem Academia in the 1960s. And I think that that was the decade in, in which the academics in Jerusalem, many of whom the direct heirs of earlier liberalism and humanism from the Buberites all the way to uh, Talmon, Isaiah Berlin, who came to visit quite often, and the people who read his works, created the first length of distance between abstract liberal theory and the general public in Israel, unable, perhaps, or not realizing the importance of passing on a liberal theory bite size to the education system and to the general public. Isaiah Berlin, and I was fortunate enough to talk with him about that, left an impact in Israel mainly through his two concepts of liberty which were mentioned here yesterday. I wish he had made an impact through another notion, the notion of benign nationhood dovetailing with liberalism, the notion of the bent twig, what happens when people are downtrodden by an elite until they lash back again. That part of Isaiah Berlin did not sink in Jerusalem or elsewhere in Israel. And we were left with a pretty abstract liberal theory, later complemented by the Israeli reception of John Rawls, again within the walls of academia. Never later than that. So a rising generation leading to three more generations of liberal intellectuals in Israel. By the time the messianism, the post Six Day War messianism, caused both Likud, pre-Likud and Likud, and religious Zionism to divorce from their own liberal segments, and they had liberal segments, the Jabostinskites liberal segment, the Burg, Yosef Burg liberal segment, divorced and cast away with the rising tide of extremism in the nationalist secular and especially the nationalist religion part of religious leadership and constituency, those legacies were lost. This is the Jabotinsky we are sometimes longing for today, not always, by the way, justifiably, but certainly an element, a liberal element, Begin, Menachem Begin being the last of the heirs of that liberal element. That was the death of revisionist liberalism, and in almost neat parallel, the death of the liberal element in the old moderate mafdal and religious party. By the time we reach the last two decades, and I'll be very quick, we have a full divorce between the liberal segments of mainstream Zionism, the revisionist movement, and religious Zionism, a de-liberalization of all these parts of the map which are becoming the electoral majority, and we have the ongoing identification of liberals with the left. This happens in the United States as well, I know, but here it happened earlier and more cuttingly. So, <clears throat> civil rights lawyers, 
are lefties. In the 70s began the great hate for civil rights lawyers, Felicia Langer, Leat Semel, you name it. The Civil Rights Association, which was created and founded by quite a plethora of different people, of different origins too, once again pushed from civil rights into a position of a lefty. Shulamit Aloni's small fraction Ratz party, the human rights party, civil rights party, along with merits, liberalism as left, uh, the judiciary, left wing, and left wing in the last decade, increasingly identified by leaders of this country and their cohorts as un-Jewish and even treacherous to Israel. I want to end on a positive note, and there is a positive note, because I hardly mentioned the tradition of Israeli social democracy. And while liberalism had gone down from its promising start in the Jewish Congresses in Europe, through its middle class respectability and judiciary respectability in the early decades of the state, <coughs> to its lefty traitor position in public discourse today, the other great dormant legacy, which is not dead, social democracy. I mentioned Ben-Gurion. I don't think all the fathers, founding fathers and mothers of Israeli social democracy, the labor Zionism, were liberals. I doubt whether Gordon or even Bel Katzenelson were liberals by the book. But a certain print, a certain legacy imprinted on Israeli Zionist social democracy that is not liberal by pedigree, by intellectual history, and combined with a Jewish legacy, which is also not liberal by the book, have endowed present Israeli society, not with John Locke, John Stuart Mill, John Rawls liberalism, but with the kind of social democratic humanism that can today work as well as liberalism and possibly even a little better. When we strip out the main deficiencies of liberalism itself, especially its haughtiness, its academization, its inability to read the street and the internet, when we look at those deficiencies of liberalism itself, it might turn out the social democratic humanism, not all social democratic, but social democratic humanism, alive and well in the Israeli public sphere and seeking a new political home, is the best hope not just for social democracy, but also for liberalism itself. Thank you. <laughs>